we're told Lutislavsky's Chantefleurs et Chantefables is a song cycle for soprano voice and chamber orchestra, completed in 1991. Textually, the songs use the poetry of 20th century French surrealist Robert Desnos. A series of children's poems compiled and published posthumously in 1955 under the title Chantefables et Chantefleurs, Lutislavsky reverses the title to distinguish the poem's publication and his musical composition. Lutislavsky takes nine poems for his cycle. The Marvel of Peru, The Grasshopper, The Speedwell, The Dog Rose, The Hawthorn and The Wisteria, The Tortoise, The Rose, The Alligator, The Angelica and The Butterfly. Today I want to focus on the ninth song of the cycle, Le Papillon, The Butterfly as I think it presents a compact opportunity to look at numerous aspects of Lutoslavsky's compositional technique. For example, it demonstrates the musical kernels and composition techniques that he uses to build movements and works from. Looking at Le Papillon will also provide a snapshot into his harmonic thinking and the use of ad libitum techniques often called limited aleatory or aleatory counterpoint. The score to the entire song cycle can be found on Ithu, uh, I'll put a link in the description below. I also found a thesis that includes an analysis of Lutislavsky's Chantefleurs, uh, Chantefables, along with uh, some other pieces. Um, this helped me with some broader observations that I present here, and I'd recommend reading it if you want to know more about Lutislavsky's writing and this song cycle specifically. Covering some essentials, the instrumentation of the entire song cycle is what we might call a chamber or smaller orchestra. Um, although it does have a reasonable uh, minimum set of strings requirement. Um, and it includes soprano voice, one flute, one oboe, one clarinet, which is doubled by uh, piccolo and bass clarinet in some movements, uh, one bassoon, uh, which is doubled by contrabassoon in some movements, uh, one trumpet, one French horn, one trombone, percussion, um, timpani, harp, piano which doubles celeste in a movement and some strings with minimum numbers given at eight first violins six seconds four violas four cellos and two double basses however in the papillon the trombone is omitted and the percussionist uses only a tambourine and uh, a xylo rimba when reading Lutislavsky's score, I would also recommend reading the instructions provided at the beginning. While well, I plan to go into Lutislavsky's uh, instructions for ad libitum sections later, it is worth bearing in mind how his scores use accidentals. The standard is for accidentals to carry through a bar, however in Lutislavsky's scores they only correspond to uh, the note they precede. Moreover, headless notes imply repetition of the preceding note. Unsurprisingly, the structure of Le Papillon's composition is around the song's text, with Lutislavsky using several strategies to give the short composition shape and a sense of drama. For example, we can break the poem into four units, two of which share a thematic similarity. As we can see from the examples on the screen, each stanza has six lines, and each stanza comprises two halves of three lines, following a kind of A, B, C, B structure. Lutislavsky marries the music with this poetic structure, giving each subsection consistent thematic material. In other words, while each idea feels like a part of the whole composition, each section contains melodic qualities that are similar to other phrases within their wider subsection. Subsection C, for example, is the most distinct and is characterised by its use of stepwise motion. At first a major second motif, the second and third phrases present falling chromatic ideas. Subsections A and B, in comparison to C, both make use of third intervals that often relate to the underlying harmonic progression. Instead, these two subsections differentiate themselves gesturally. Subsection A capitalises on its slightly longer lines to produce more substantial lyrical phrases of a kind of cantabile quality. Subsection B, on the other hand, becomes more punctuated, rhetorical and motivic. In other words, A is more song-like and flowing in melody and text, and B is more like a series of short statements 
that the subsection's melodic material actively articulates via the repetition of notes on each syllable of the place names. In addition to characterising each part of the text through melody, Lutislavsky also punctuates the form of this movement, giving it a dramatic arc through the use of ad libitum techniques. As I said in passing, Le Papillon is significant in the song cycle, not only for being the last movement, but for being the only movement where Lutislavsky uses his ad libitum, or limited aleatory technique. The use of ad libitum passages distinguishes the movement by creating distinctive textures which bring a sense of climax to the entire song cycle. However, it also articulates the structure of the movement itself. For instance, Lutislavsky uses the technique three times in this movement, once in the beginning, once between the stanzas, and once close to the end. The simple use of this technique, which stands out on the page and in performance, bookend the stanzas and movement. In combination with the changes of melodic quality, these textural punctuation marks draw out general changes of mood between the sections of the piece. In the first stanza, there is a sense of trepidation, followed by a rise in tension. This rise in tension is achieved by the rising phrases of subsection B, climaxing on a high A flat. This is something that I'll come back to uh, later on. Uh, in this second stanza, the falling chromatic phrases communicate a sense of lament, dejection or pity. The three million butterflies, doubtless a sight to behold, become a pest or plague, stealing the people's broth. The ad libitum textures serve not only to imagine the chaos of the butterflies in flight, but to allow the text to breathe and for the listener to feel the shifts in feeling. In addition to bookending the movement and stanzas, Lutislavsky uses the structural significance of these textures to his advantage by imposing a larger harmonic arc. Using the same nine-note chord voicing, Lutislavsky merely transposes the chord up a minor third in the middle section so that the chord starts on a G instead of an E. The final use of the ad libitum technique sees the same chord voicing and pitches used in the opening. It is worth bearing in mind that Lutislavsky, while using similar motivic and gestural qualities between these aleatory textures, does not simply copy and transpose the same material. He does vary them musically too. Before moving on to harmony, it's worth briefly discussing Lutislavsky's ad libitum technique, as I think this piece provides a handy snapshot into the practice and how Lutislavsky instructs these passages to be performed on the page. Taking the opening of Le Papillon, we can see that it opens with a flurry of activity that cascades upwards through most of the orchestra. In this opening, the music is a kind of bridge between the metered and the aleatory. Lutislavsky uses dark arrowheads and dashed vertical lines to inform the players to play in time with one another, lining up with each downbeat instructed by the conductor. Effectively five pulses, where the players play in time, the music suddenly shifts to a free time texture. This change is denoted by the white arrow-headed uh, downbeat that tells the conductor and players that this is the point at which vertical alignment no longer matters. Each player therefore is free to play their respective repeated phrase until instructed otherwise. Lutislavsky is careful to construct repeated passages that start at different points and which boast different lengths. Therefore while players might maintain a tempo set out by the opening pulse, their parts will slide out of sync uh, with one another inviting different combinations and counterpointing of notes. Within these aleatory passages, Lutislavsky has the conductor use a more subtle left-hand cue to add further players to the texture. To differentiate this instruction in the score, Lutislavsky uses half an arrowhead. We can see this through the introduction of the trumpet at the top of page 64. Lutislavsky uses the left hand uh, gesture for its clear difference to the standard right handed downbeat seen in the opening. In essence, the right hand instructs a progression for all instruments, while the left hand applies to subsections or individuals. The progression instructed by right hand downbeats could be the addition of players, as it is in the very opening, or a transition or subtraction, uh, as it is toward the end of this opening section. 
Lutislavsky uses a white arrowhead to instruct the ensemble to suddenly cease playing and for the voice to enter, creating a dramatic shift in the piece's texture before moving to a standard metered passage. Lutislavsky is known for using 12-note chords in many of his pieces. However, in Le Papillon, while using many pitches through the metered sections, he derives much of his harmonic language from the opening aleatory 9-note chord texture. For example, if we extract the sustained chords between rehearsal marks 1 and 6, we can see Lutislavsky uses only three chord types. The first is an augmented chord quality with the major triad and added flat in 13th or uh, 6th and 6th. It depends on how you want to view that. Um, The second is a minor major 7th chord and the third is a minor triad that has an added sharp 4, or you could see it's an added sharp 11. Each of these chords can be linked to the opening 9 note chord. The most significant of these chords, which is easiest to spot and extract, is the major triad with the added flattened 13th or 6th. Again, depending on how you want to see it. This is because it appears in the same voicing in both the extract we are looking at and the 9 note chord reduction. Both are voiced to outline the augmented quality, presenting a major triad in second inversion with the added flat 13th or 6th just above the third. The other two chords are slightly less obvious as they are voiced slightly differently in their block chord forms through um, this section. For instance, in the 9 note chord, the 4th, 5th, 6th and 7th notes form uh, enharmonically a minor chord with added sharp 4. However, when voiced in a block chord within the piece, Lutislavsky presents each of them as a minor triad over the top of a sharp 4. Similarly, while the minor major 7th chord is presented in a broken 3rd inversion form in the 9th note chord, in the extract it is in a stacked root position. Why and how Lutislavsky chose these subchords, or the 9 note super chord, is not something that I can answer. However, it all feels very deliberate, something that Lutislavsky would do based on what I know about his composition technique. Furthermore, many of the choices feel aesthetically appropriate. For example, the use of the added flat sixth as an augmented sonority suits the surreal aesthetic of this poem. Disnus was a surrealist poet, and this is a surreal poem where millions of butterflies steal people's broths. The augmented triad is something of a surrealist trope, used in many pieces to evoke the magical, surreal, or dreamlike. Lutislavsky's harmony through this section follows several patterns that shed light on his thinking and why he might have chosen these chords and then applied them in the nine note super chord. If we start from rehearsal mark three, for instance, an intervallic sequence unfolds along with a cycling of the different chord structures that we've discussed. For example, each three chord phrase follows the pattern of added flat 13 or flat 6 chord, add sharp 4 chord, followed by um, the minor major 7th, at least up until the A flat major 7th structure at rehearsal mark 6. Moreover, if we follow the root of each chord, we can see it follows a pattern of up a major 3rd, up a minor 2nd, and down a minor 3rd to restart the cycle. In addition to the sequential progression of the harmony that we discussed previously, Lutislavsky also uses a sequence to control the lowest voice's progression in the chordal padding of his accompaniment. Different intervallically to the fundamental progression, the lowest voice follows a pattern of up a minor third, followed by down a minor second. Repeating the note that it falls onto once to end the sequence, the pattern starts again, climbing a minor third. Upon closer inspection, it is remarkable just how many patterns emerge in this passage. Another fascinating progression that these combinations of chord structures facilitate is a rising minor second or chromatic voice leading in the upper three voices. As we mentioned earlier in this article, this section of the music is rising in tension, building to a climax with the soprano voice part. 
Lutoslavsky's use of rising semitones accentuates this rise in tension harmonically. However, rather than simply having all voices rising in semitones, there is a sophisticated progression that adds nuance. The bass and root progressions all have descending parts but ultimately rise with each beginning of the, the larger phrase structure in the sequence. By doing this, Lutoslavsky can keep the tension rising for a longer duration, making the musical climax all the more dramatic and poignant once we reach rehearsal mark six. An utterly charming song cycle, we can also see how below the charm there is a great deal of sophistication as well. In analysis and deconstruction, Lutoslavsky demonstrates how a composer can connect different structures to create engaging and fitting progressions that tie the piece together. From a composition perspective, in construction, however, Lutoslavsky shows us how there is more to be had from those structures and ideas we already uh, may have created. If we have one structure, could we invert or retrograde it to create a form of symmetry? If we have a chord or pitch set, could it be used as the basis of a progression or sequence? So often in composition, we think we need to keep building and finding new answers. Lutoslavsky shows us that the answers might already lie in what we have. Beyond these structural interconnections, Lutoslavsky also opens the door to different textures and sonorities. He shows us, via his limited aleatory technique or aleatory counterboy, how we might control time and instrumentalists in different ways to create compelling sounds. Most importantly, he lets us hear what three million butterflies sound like. <laughs> 